What they would do is they would attach weights to these Dutch Baptists and they would throw them over the water because they got rebaptized. The government saw them as heretics. And why did these people believe that this was a doctrine that was worth dying for? Why is it? Today, we're going to learn or study a little bit about baptism and what's the deal behind it, all right? Uh, and I felt like this was a, an appropriate follow-up to what Pastor Silver preached uh, on a Sunday evening and uh, concerning John the Baptist. But in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, I'll read it and you could just follow along there. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now in this passage of Scripture, it's perhaps one of the richest in its doctrinal content. Um, it has a lot of teaching inside of it. It's very rich. In itself, we can find baptism and its proper mode. How is it supposed to be given? It's supposed to be given by immersion. The authority and the administrator must be given by God. Another thing is the baptism is an identification. How does it play a role? And then it also shows us the deity of Christ. It shows us the Trinity. And it shows us that baptism is an act of obedience. All right. Now, these were just six things that I just pointed out. There is a lot more just in these passages alone that you can pull out of. But there are many questions that the world has asked about baptism and even the term Baptist. It's why name a denomination after an ordinance, you know? And does how I get baptized matter? Questions like why were men and women back in history giving their lives just for an ordinance? Or some would say, why do they give their lives to a sacrament? What is an ordinance? Or is it a sacrament? Does, uh, does where I get baptized matter? Does it matter if it's at a camp or if it's at a church? See, I want to just point out Martin Luther and John Calvin back in the 1600s. These were the leaders of the Protestant, uh, Protestant movement. Uh, in fact, they're called Protestants because they protested against the established church, which is the Catholic Church, right? But Martin Luther and John Calvin themselves, they have written record where they made fun of Baptists. Baptists existed before the Protestant movement. That's what I'm trying to say. And not only that, after Martin Luther's religion or his belief system, Lutheranism, and John Calvin's belief system, Calvinism, took over cities, those cities would persecute Baptists that were within those cities. So it's like they were doing the exact same thing as Catholics. So what did the Christians do? Something else in medieval, the, during the medieval period, just before Protestant uh, Reformation took place, drowning was the punishment that was given for people who got baptized. Why? Why punish somebody who believes that they need to get baptized all over again? Like, for an example, Dutch Anabaptists were condemned to, that, to death by the Catholic government. What they would do is they would attach weights to these Dutch Baptists and they would throw them over the water because they got rebaptized. The government saw them as heretics. And why did these people believe that this was a doctrine that was worth dying for? Why is it? So, I want to ask just 
these different questions we have, and we're going to try and answer them piece by piece, uh, but surely I want to point out also God had his reasons to why we hold to this doctrine specifically so dearly. And I'm going to give you some of those reasons, but first we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us today, and I thank you for everyone that is here, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you would empower me with your Holy Spirit, calm my nerves, Lord, and I pray that um, even though this may not be as much preaching as it is uh, teaching, but uh, I pray, Father, that our hearts would be stirred by this message and help us to understand doctrinal truth. Uh, why baptism? Why Baptists? I pray, Father, that everyone here would be stirred, and also, Lord, that we would uh, just uh, hold on to your word as hard as we can as, uh, as the days are drawing nearer to the end. I pray, Father, that you would glorify yourself in our midst today. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first, I want to point out the authority of John the Baptist. All right? Pastor Silver did a great job on Sunday evening talking about John the Baptist's life. And for sure, his ministry didn't last that long. It was about a year. John the Baptist was given authority, and we're often told to never compare ourselves with other Christians. And because we're human beings, we tend to compare ourselves with other human beings, but the only person we ought to be comparing ourselves truly is who? Jesus Christ. We're Christians, right? We are little Christs. So the person who sh we should be comparing our life to and copying is Christ. In our story, Jesus is the candidate and the authority was uh, John the Baptist. Now, it, I'd like to point out from where Jesus was, which was Galilee, in our story, he traveled 50 kilometers to come and see John the Baptist. Now, if you know Galilee, there is a sea at Galilee, right? Why didn't he get baptized there? Jesus had to come to John the Baptist because John was the one given the authority to baptize. Now, as I pointed out, Pastor Silver had talked about John the Baptist, and he had pointed out also that John the Baptist was the man called the forerunner, the one who came before Christ. He foreran, right? So John preached about something called repentance. Anyone who believed that message, was, uh, they got baptized, and this showed John's authority. It didn't show that John had, uh, was able to manipulate these people. It was showing that the message that John had was from God. That's what it was showing. And these people that were getting baptized, they were submitting themselves to the message of John, which is in turn, given from God. So in Acts 13, 24 to 25, what we see is when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. So you can see there he's that forerunner. So what was this message? What was John preaching in the first place? John, as the forerunner, was given authority from God to be baptizing people as they repented. These were people that believed the message of repentance. We throw this word a lot around, especially when it comes to salvation. People who understood that, works, that the works they did outwardly didn't matter as much as their heart did. They were getting ready for a Messiah who was about to come and establish an earthly kingdom, right? You remember that the Jews were always looking for that Messiah who will have an earthly kingdom. Therefore, they repented of their sin, and they were turning away. They were getting right with God. Now, if you're in your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 1. Put uh, maybe your, your prayer list there in this page so that you don't lose it, but go to Mark chapter 1. Verse 4, it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So, 
when we get baptized, there is an authority that had to administer it. In Jesus' case, it was John the Baptist. This authority in our day and age is the pastor. He, in turn, is given authority from Christ. Right? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 to 4. This is a charge given to pastors. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, the pastor, which is the shepherd, he receives the charge from Christ, who is the chief shepherd. He's the one giving the authority to the pastor to baptize. Right? So, we talked about the authority. In this case, Jesus Christ was humbling himself to his second cousin. Second cousin because Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, and John was the son of Elizabeth. Okay, so second cousin. Jesus was humbling himself. Same with any person who wants to get baptized in our church. They have to humble themselves, right? So it's putting themselves underneath a leadership, underneath an authority. Now, next thing, the candidate's identification. I think this one is the biggest one. Christ identified with John the Baptist's message. Okay, let's... Turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Today is going to be a very condensed uh, doctrine survey. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In order for our sin to get paid for, Christ identified with the sin. He became sin for us so that he could fulfill all righteousness, so he could give his righteousness to us and take our sin. Christ identified with it. Now, something else he identified with, and turn back to Matthew chapter, uh, chapter number 3. You'll notice something else that we can identify, okay, is the Holy Spirit identified with Christ when he descended like a dove. The Father identified with Christ when he said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, in verse 17. Christ identified with us as he was foretelling what will happen one day, the death, burial, and resurrection. And then three were, these three here, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, all three were present at the same time. So three persons at the same time. So you have another proof of the Trinity there. Okay, so this is one of the biggest reasons we preach that salvation does not require baptism. And this, unfortunately, has become more and more of a heretical doctrine that has been preached often in many other churches. It's called baptismal regeneration. You all know what I'm talking about? Right? It's where they preach that in order to be saved, you must be first baptized. And it has become more and more uh, leading astray a lot of people. And usually they base their claims off of verses in Acts. And simply put, all those verses in context explain that belief is first necessary before baptism. Just as Orthodox Christianity has always taught. In Paul's case, he pointed out that we identify with Christ. Oftentimes, we try to think, okay, well, I want to identify with the friends I, that I roam around with. The friends that are around me, I identify with them. But the truth of the matter is, Christians ought to identify with Christ. 
right? We are dead to our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's turn there. Keep another, your finger there in uh, Matthew 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter 3, uh, char, sorry, chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What do we call this? Sorry? I think I hear you. The Gospel. I know how Pastor White feels now. <laughs> yeah, I think I hear you. It's the gospel. Yes, this is the gospel. The good news. And Paul identified with this. Something else, uh, our identity is in Christ, and this is extremely important to learn because our identity is no more with the world. Something else we see, and this is also talked about by Paul again in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. Go there, please. Chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 19 and 20. 19 to 21, excuse me. And many of you may know it by heart, but chapter 2, verse 19 to 21, it says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So you can see here, Paul is trying to teach the Galatians, once you have gotten saved, what you're, what you're actually doing is you're identifying with what Christ had done on the cross. In turn, baptism is that picture. Now, I think most mature Christians understand this. This is fundamental basics 101 of this doctrine called baptism. And it's, it's an important thing to learn. This is also why we know that Christians that have been saved now have the power to resist sin because we have died to sin. We are no more with sin. Now, one more piece of identification, and this one we tend to not pay too much attention to, but it's important to point out to. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. One more thing of identification that takes place in a Christian who gets baptized in a church. Where you get baptized also denotes what you are agreeing to. In Christ's case, he agreed to what John had been preaching this whole time. Repentance for the kingdom. We identify with a local church and its doctrine. In order to become a member of a local church, baptism must take place. And here you see it in Acts chapter 41 and 42. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So you could see the order there again. Gladly received his word. That means saved. They were baptized, which is what we've all been talking about right now, which means identified with the doctrine they got, then got baptized. And then they were added to the church, which means they got their membership. Okay, so when we get baptized, we may not realize just how significant it actually is. In baptism, we identify with Christ, with a, do with a body of doctrine, and with a local church. So it's getting more and more fancy, what we're learning here. Okay? Now the mode of baptism. How to be baptized. And this one's a contentious, contentious one. Immersion is the mode of baptism that is biblical because it pictures the gospel. Christ did here in this passage, turn back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Christ did here in this passage shows 
this picture. Verse 16, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. The candidate in this case, it was Jesus. He came out straightway out, right? Therefore, if you're going to come out straightway out, there must be, you must be underneath something. Am I making sense? I hope I'm making sense. All right. And even in Acts 22, verse 16, go ahead and turn there. Lots of Bible flipping today. Acts 22, verse 16, it says, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So you can see there, uh, it was Ananias talking to Paul, and this was Paul recounting the story of how he got saved. And you can see that Ananias was sure to tell him, Arise. Oftentimes, in today's churches, they have even compromised on the, on the doctrine of, of baptism. When it comes to baptism, they bring the water to the candidate as opposed to the candidate to the water. The fact that Ananias said, arise, means that Paul had to get up and leave where he was to go to a body of water to get baptized. Okay? So... You can see here, it's not aspersion. Aspersion is the fancy word for sprinkling. And then it's not affusion, which is the fancy word for pouring, right? That's how a lot of churches think baptism happens. There do not, those kinds of baptisms do not count as proper administrations of baptism. So baptism here, it still really pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We don't consider sprinkling of dirt over a body, a burial, right? That's not a burial. You got to put a ton of dirt over it, the body and you have to completely cover it up. If there's a little bit of the body showing, it's not buried as much as people like to say so, okay? Some have argued that baptism is also a word that was created by Baptists over the years. This is a huge contention when it comes to Bible translations. As you know, there are a lot of Bible societies around the world. Some of them have been started by Methodists. Some have been started by Presbyterians. Others have been started by Baptists. Some have accused Baptists that Baptists have added the word baptism when it's not baptism. Because remember, those other denominations started from the Protestant Reformation. They came out of the Catholic Church, so they brought along with them some practices, baptism with sprinkling and pouring. But nevertheless, God has preserved his word so well. The original word for baptism in Greek, you may have heard, is baptizo, right? It's called a transliteration, where you take the Greek word, you try to find the letters that are equivalent in English, and you kind of make the translation. So baptism, baptizo. But sure enough, there was a Greek physician, and here's what he said. The clear, uh, this was taken out of an excerpt of a, uh, of a magazine. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 BC. So this is a recipe. It's a recipe for making pickles and it's helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetables should first be dipped, which is the word bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of uh, vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary, the second the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change. When used in the New Testament, this word more often refers to our union and identification with Christ than to our water baptism. So you could see here, baptism was used in a 2,200-year-old uh, recipe. All right? 
So it's not a word we created. It's already existed a long for a long time. You can see, like pickles, we publicly show our identification through the immersion process. Okay? Last one. Promise. Obedience. Obedience. And this is perhaps even more contentious. Baptism has never been a means of salvation or a means of producing grace. Baptism has never been called a sacrament. Baptism has never been able to save people. Baptism has always been an ordinance given by Christ for Christians to obey. So, what is an ordinance? An ordinance is something that is essentially an order or a command given by God to obey until Jesus takes us home. I think the scriptures are clear when it comes to how our salvation is, uh, we, how we get our salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 3, 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justifi justified by faith, without the deeds of the law. Titus 3, 5 and 6, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So baptism is a good work, but is not capable of saving. So why do people call it a sacrament? Why do, what is a sacrament? Let's go with that. And a sacrament, the word sacrament, I might, this might be the first time you've ever heard of it, maybe. The word sacrament was once a good word. Not in the Bible, but still a good word. The person who first used the, con, used the word sacrament in context of baptism was a man named Tertullian. Who has heard of Tertullian? All right, a few Bible scholars, all right. Tertullian, he also used it well. So he wasn't a, her a heretic, so to speak. And here's how he used it. A sacrament was the name given to a badge called a sacramentum. sacramentum. And it, pre it was presented to a Roman soldier when he enlisted. It was an emblem that identified him with the Roman army. It was for identification. So at first, it was a good illustration. The fact that Tertullian said, oh, it's a sacrament because it shows identification in the Roman army, that was good. But unfortunately, as heresy crept into larger local churches at, in the first and second century, the word sacrament soon became synonymous with baptism, which was changing in meaning from being an identification with Christ to the way to Christ. It became an identification with Christ. To, uh, it became away from the... Yeah, you get it. So today the word sacrament holds a lot of baggage, all to do with the Catholic Church, unfortunately. This is why ordinance is the better word. God demands that salvation be done by faith, and the Christian life is a life of works to be done by faith. Baptism comes after because it is a work of faith. It's not what you should have, it's not that you should have faith in your baptism, but because you have faith, you get baptized. I hope that makes sense to all of us here. Okay? Faith is shown when you obey what God had said in His Word. So we Christians have an obligation to get baptized. It's a requirement of obedience, not for salvation. Christ said in John 14, 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Christ also said in John 15, 14, Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever, whatsoever I command you. There was a preacher, he once said this about Christians who claimed to be Christians but didn't, didn't want to get baptized. What he said was, the wish to live unrecognized as a Christian, unwilling to share the responsibilities or discharge the duties of discipleship, 
and yet hoping for its blessings and rewards, is both selfish and mercenary, and indicates that the new birth has perhaps not yet transpired. So obedience is expected from us. All right, conclusion. If you are a Christian today and have been wanting some reasons to get baptized, I've given you a few. If a Christian here had been baptized, has not yet been baptized, you're really missing out on some blessings. There are blessings for obedience given by God that are not being claimed because of a simple waiting or disobedience. So don't wait. Remember, we obey by faith. According to Hebrews 11.6, we know that without faith it is impossible to please God. Remember the words of the Ethiopian eunuch who asked, what doth hinder me to be baptized? So do you see why men and women would have given their lives for the sake of a doctrine? Imagine hundreds of millions of people that had placed their faith in going underwater or sprinkling or pouring and had one day presumed that their eternity was settled when they woke up in hell. Can you see why people gave their lives for this? Baptism is so important that Christ specifically even included it in what we call the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Mark 16, 15 and 16 also says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be saved. Damned. So the commission is not fulfilled unless we also teach them and baptize them. We don't have hindrances like the first centuries do, uh, the first century Christians did. We have a lot of freedom. So if you are a Christian that is considering why they should get baptized, here are some reasons. And if there are Christians who want reasons to get involved in reaching out for evangelizing, reaching out in soul winning and reaching out to more people. Here are some more reasons. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.